There's a passage where the Buddha is giving advice on how to counsel someone who's dying. And the advice assumes that the person has some level of attainment in meditation. But still, it's good advice for everybody, and good advice to keep in mind in case you don't have anybody hovering around giving you advice when you die. The first thing the Buddha said is to ask the person, are you worried about your family? And if the person says yes, you have to remind the person when you're dying now, there's nothing you can do about them. Because otherwise what happens is when you die, as the Buddha said, you latch on to a craving, and that takes you on to the next life, to the next body. And the craving may not necessarily be for another body, but it may be for a certain situation or a certain issue that you're concerned about. And if you're concerned about your family, you get reborn in your family. You can imagine becoming the, the child of your niece or nephew. Or maybe nobody in the family is going to have any kids, and you become their dog. You're very protective. But still, you're a dog. So you've got to cut off all thoughts of your family. They have their karma, you have your karma. And you don't want to be hovering around them. I knew a woman in Thailand one time who had two sons. Her husband had left her after the second son was born. And he just disappeared. And so she had to raise the two sons herself. And the first son was bright, personable, athletic, good-looking. The second son was none of those. And the mother really showed a lot of favoritism with the first son. Well, it was the first son who died. He hopped on his motorcycle one day to pick up some stuff at the store, and within a few minutes the word came back he had been run over. And after a week or so, she came to see me and said she had a sense that he was still around the house, leaving little signs, like if something good was going to happen that day, there'd be a little dollop of clay left in her drawer, and if something bad was going to happen, a little rock. And she wanted him to stay there. There's a belief in Thailand that as long as the body is not cremated, the spirit will hang around. Once it's cremated, then the spirit has no locus and move on. So she wanted to have the body stored away until she died. I had to talk to her and say, look, you're keeping him around the house. It's a miserable life, being a spirit hovering around the house, no matter how much you may love your family. Let him go. So she finally had the body cremated, and sure enough, things quieted down. So you don't want to be hovering around your family. So you've got to cut off thoughts of your family. And if you're not on good terms with your family, cut off thoughts of revenge about your family, because those two will pull you back, thinking about how somebody in the family wronged you. You don't want that to be the craving that determines where you're going to be reborn. Then the next step is to ask the person, are you afraid of missing human sensual pleasures? And if the person says yes, then you've got to remind the person the drawbacks of human sensual pleasures. One way of doing that is to remind the person there are better pleasures and higher levels of heaven. But then, of course, as you go up the levels of heaven, the, the sensual pleasures there have their drawbacks too. This is another one of the things that pulls us back. There's a certain pleasure we had in this lifetime, and you miss it, you won't have it again. And the prospect suddenly appears to you as you're dying that you could have that pleasure again, or maybe something better, something nicer. And you go for it. You sign the contract without looking at the fine print. And part of the fine print, of course, is that you're going to get a body. 
And if it's a human body, it's got all the drawbacks of a human body. This is why we have that chant on the 32 parts of the body. You're going to get a body with these parts, and each of the parts has its diseases. That's one of the contemplations the Buddha has you focus on while you're sick, just in case you happen to die of the illness, to remind yourself that this illness that you have is not a chance thing. It's been waiting for you. Every part of the body has a disease waiting for you, not just one disease, many diseases. In fact, as a John Fun interprets the passage, he says, the different parts of the body are diseases. Think about it. Each little cell is programmed to grow, and it's the other cells around it that get it to stop. Otherwise, if the cell just grew and grew and grew, it would become a cancer and kill you. So if each little part had its way, it would, it would take over. It would malfunction. So the parts are just waiting to malfunction. We're lucky that we get the body to function at all. So if you go for human sensual pleasures, this is what you're going to be stuck with. The body that's ready to grow ill, the body that's going to age. There's a passage in the canon that says, aging drops on you, as if out of nowhere. And the body you used to know is not there anymore. It's been replaced by something else. And it doesn't ask permission. Again, when you latch onto the body, it's not the case that the body has agreed that it's going to do what you want. And it feels no obligation to you, no matter how well you take care of it. When I first came back to the States, I got a phone call one time from this one guy who'd been a master of martial arts. And he'd been able to control his body, and his body was able to do all kinds of things smash through all kinds of stuff. And now it had turned on him, and he felt betrayed. He'd taken such good care of it, he'd trained it, and this is what the body does. He says, well, the body doesn't feel any obligation at all. As I said, each part is ready to get diseased. And once you have a body, of course, it's going to open you to all kinds of accidents. You can't guarantee that you're going to have a healthy body all the time, or even a sound body, or a complete one. And this is just part of the fine print of signing on to sensual pleasures. The other, of course, is the, the position of being in s slavery to sensual pleasures. It's not a really good place to be. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha has you think about all the drawbacks of sensuality. One of these images that's pretty vivid around here at the monastery is when a raptor gets a little piece of meat, it has to fly away, make sure other raptors don't get it. And if they attack it, sometimes it has to let go, otherwise they'll kill it. So that, and the Buddha said, that's sensuality. Our sensual pleasures are like a bead of honey on the blade of a very sharp knife. To enjoy that little bit of honey, you have to be extremely careful. There's a lot of pleasures in the world you, you can enjoy only in a very dangerous situation. And when you get them, other people want them. So the Buddha has you reflect on the drawbacks of the body and the drawbacks of sensuality, so that your mind doesn't go flowing over to, to a human rebirth again. Even Deva's sensual pleasures have their drawbacks. It is possible on some levels of the, the Deva realms to practice the Dharma, but it's so easy to get carried away. You get these pleasures you never had before, and part of the mind says, well, let me enjoy them for a while, and then I'll practice. And then you forget. So it's good to reflect on these drawbacks, to keep the mind from just grabbing at whatever. 
and to look for something better. This is why we practice for the deathless. This is why we practice for dispassion. To keep in mind the fact there is something better than these things. There are cases where people gain awakening at the moment of death. We reflect on the fact that even devas suffer from self-identity, identifying with the aggregates one way or another, either identifying with the aggregates themselves or feeling that they are someone who possesses these aggregates, wants to use them as tools, whether in the aggregates or the aggregates are in them. Even a state of infinite consciousness, you can develop a sense of self around that. Sense of infinite space, you can develop a self around that. A very strong sense of pride. One of my favorite stories about monks meditating and gaining visions was of one monk who was meditating out in the forest one time. And as he was sitting there meditating, these devas would come past and they'd stop and they'd bow down to him. He thought to himself, gee, this is pretty cool being a meditating monk. Even devas have bowed down to you. All of a sudden, this foot appeared out of the sky and kicked him in the head and said, Space devas can bow down if they want, and if not, if they don't. So, in that case, the the monk had a problem with pride, but you imagine the space devas also had a problem with pride, too. So when we reflect on the dangers of pride and the dangers of self-identification, you want to be in a position where you say, I don't have to go any of these places. I don't have to latch on to any of these things. Now, what that means, of course, is that you have to have been practicing. This is one of the reasons why we call it practicing meditation, because when when death comes, you're going to have to perform, and you don't want to suddenly suffer from performance anxiety. You want to know what you're doing. You have to be mindful, and you have to be alert, and you have to be ardent all the way through to the end, even as the body's falling apart. So as you're sitting here meditating and finding yourself giving in to a little pain here, a little pain there, or say, I'm tired tonight. Remind yourself, when the day comes to perform, it's going to be a lot more difficult than this. So learn to practice with pain. Learn to practice with the different hindrances. Essential desire, ill will, all the way down the line. So then when the time comes to perform, you will have mastered the skills. Now there are cases, as I said, where people suddenly pull themselves together at the moment of death. But you make it a lot more likely that you'll be able to do that if you keep practicing. Practice in spite of pain, or you might say practice because of pain. Practice because of tiredness. Practice because of the heat outside in the summer and the cold in the winter. Because you want to be able to master these things. <laughs>